Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. You know, when you think about what these people went through so that I could have this life, I don't take that for granted for one minute. I just knew that I wanted to do something that I could feel some ownership of um, and really put my mark on it, but also to help people. If I could put together a group of people like that who could both be in community with one another, not feel so alone with it, and inspire and encourage one another and bring their wisdom to something like that, I think that would be really instrumental. I was raised to believe that success looked like this. You know, you go to school, you develop a profession, you meet somebody, you get married, you have 2.3 children, you you follow this path. And I'm, I'm sort of painting a very conventional picture, but, you know, whatever that image of success was for you. And, and then you follow that path and you realize, actually, that I don't really like this. I need to do something else to feel successful. I think we really have to be far more mindful of what success means to us and to really, we owe it to ourselves to go after whatever that is for us, or at least to try to discover what that is. Hey, hello there. This is Fei Wu, and you're listening to a regular interview episode of the podcast. I'm so thrilled that you're here. There's so many podcasts to choose from, and I appreciate your attention. Today, I have Tammy Guler Loeb on the show with us. She is a career and executive coach. We've had a few seasoned coaches on the show so far, um, but they're all quite different in terms of their background, customers they serve, and generally how they run their businesses. It's fascinating for many of us to see how coaches can enhance our personal and professional lives in significant ways. And in turn, they've built empires as coaches themselves, often working from homes, choosing the clients they enjoy working with. Quite a win-win career choice on its own. Tammy isn't just a coach. She's also part of a thriving podcaster community with me called Alt Podcasters, started by Phase World since October 2017. And I'm thrilled to see her launching her own show as of December 2018. This episode is for those of you who have hit a plateau in your career. Not that you are ready to leave, but perhaps not sure where you're going to go from here. Tammy coaches a number of clients in their 40s and 50s who are struggling with the same thing. Together, we explore Tammy's business setup as a coach and how she's able to maintain a stable income while working as an entrepreneur with a coaching business. Look, whether you're an entrepreneur or a freelancer, your income may be unpredictable at times. Tammy shared a great secret of hers to put you back in the driver's seat. Hey, are you a new podcaster or podcaster-to-be? This is a great episode for you to hear firsthand from a new podcaster like Tammy. She speaks to her learning as a podcaster, her interaction with her guests on the show, and how it changed her life and perspectives already. It's only been two months. It's not all rainbows and unicorns, but surely is worth it. Within the release of her first 10 episodes, some magic already began to spark. These are the behind the scenes stories I wish more creators will share with the community. Hey, if you're enjoying listening to Face World and the things we do for our community, for our people, our creators, please consider joining our newsletter and our tribe at faceworld.com forward slash newsletter. I've prepared an instant gift for you right there to download, which is a guide called How I Made a Living and Built a Business with My Podcast. Without further ado, please welcome. Tammy Guler Loeb to the Face World podcast. Hey, 
Have you ever thought about the fact that, you know, being Jewish um, and then knowing all these crazy stories of your ancestors and the struggles that they had to live through? And I think people understand what it entails, you know, like, does it make you feel like your life in a way is almost more spectacular and or more random or more responsibilities involved? Like, do you feel that way? Just like not only just religious aspect of things. Well, that's a know? good question, actually. Um, I mean, my, my grandparents, I only had one grandparent who was a young adult when he came over here. He was much older than the others. Um, he actually fought in World War I for the Americans. So he came over here when he was 20. Um, I don't know what propelled him to come over here. I should ask my father while my father's still alive. You know, my, my other grandparents were such young children, so it would probably be more like what their parents had to endure to get them over here. And I don't know a whole lot about that, but here's the interesting thing. I have made the assumption for many, many years that because my grandparents came over here as young children and because there was so much destruction of their property when they left, my grandmother was able to tell me the story of the soldiers coming into her house and she and her brother hiding under the bed as young children. And, you know, they came in and just demolished their houses. I know that my mother-in-law had a similar experience, although she would never talk about it in where she lived in Berlin. You know, I just think, I think about the way I grew up. I, when I was, when I was little, we had the Vietnam War. I remember the casualty reports on the radio. It never meant anything to me because I I was so little or we had air raid drills in school. You know, we had fire drills, right? You know, everybody gets out of their chair and goes outside in a, you know, in, in a formation because it's a fire drill. But we also had these air raid drills where they had a different alarm that would go off. We'd have to go to the closet, get our coats, put them over our heads, go into the hallway in school and crouch down with our coats over our heads. How old were you? Like in the elementary school? I was a little kid. I was, you know, six, five, six, seven, eight years old, maybe. Mm-hmm. I had no idea why we were doing that. And I never questioned it. It's it's funny. I was a kid who questioned things, but that wasn't something I questioned. So my point is that my ancestors went through a lot to get over here. I'm, I'm aware of that. I don't know just how much they saw or what they endured exactly. But what occurs to me is I've grown up for the most part in a very peaceful time in this country. I've always had a roof over my head, always had food on the table, always felt loved. I didn't grow up with a lot of wealth, but I grew up, you know, probably middle, upper middle class. You know, I've had, but I would say I've had the privilege of safety, security, you know, a decent, good family, a decent education, all those things. And so it's so easy to sort of, you know, when you think about what these people went through so that I could have this life, I don't take that for granted for one minute. I don't know that I think about it often enough, but I do think that, you know, and this is why I'm doing my my podcast is to say to people, look, you've been blessed with all these things. Most of us, not everyone, but most of us don't just squander it going to work every day. Like, you know, as a miserable person, just for a paycheck, like find a way to make, make, make meaning out of it. Don't just keep going to this job and hating every minute of it. I know lots of people who are doing that. And I, part of me almost feels angry with them for doing that. When did you realize that it was a bad choice? You know, I know you've been, Tammy, you've been an executive coach for a very long time. Yeah, but I, I had lots of jobs before that too. And I had several jobs where I was unhappy. And, you know, when you think about it, what's that expression? When you leave a job, you're actually leaving a boss, not necessarily the job. And I would say that that was true for me in many, in many circumstances where I was either in an organizational culture or working under a, a boss who I just didn't agree with on some things. And it made it very hard to go to work. And it's hard to wake up in the morning and not want to go to this place where you're spending eight to 10 to 12 hours a day. You know, like what is the, what are some of the examples or scenarios you've seen 
of people not liking their jobs. Do you think that's a majority or a minority of the people? I think I've heard a statistic, but you know, when you hear statistics, I know how some of those statistics are formed because I used to work in, in government where we had to put statistics out there to inform or educate the public on certain things. And I know that half of those numbers are, you know, they're based on some reality, but I have heard something like 50% or more of people don't like their jobs or don't like their workplace. I'm guessing the number's even higher than that. I Like part of me feels judgmental about it. And another part of me feels compassionate about it that there are so many people who seem to just think this is like, uh, when I hear someone say under any circumstance, they say, well, I didn't have a choice. I had to do this or that. And I'm thinking, well, I'm sure there are cases where that's true, but more often than not, I would say you probably did have a choice. You just didn't like the choices that you had in front of you. And so you assumed that you were stuck or you let yourself, it's like having a scarcity mentality, right? I don't have a choice. This is what, this is the the cards I've been dealt. I have to deal with it. Or, well, that's just who I am. I hear people say, that's just who I am. And and they're usually kind of making excuses for a part of them that doesn't necessarily um, serve them very well. You know? You know, I, over the years, I too found myself in various situations and we talked about the jobs I loved very much and then the jobs I felt absolutely miserable. And I think when we reached that point, that was so intense and I realized, you know what, tonight I'm going back on LinkedIn, I got my plan. So yeah, and I think there are also people in that space where they don't necessarily hate their jobs, but they know they should get out and grow because you know, they're kind of reached the this, this ceiling, either the glass ceiling or just a general ceiling. Uh, or they've hit a plateau of some type, you know, where they're just like, they don't, they don't feel like there's anywhere to grow or they, or the directions in which growth is available to them there, it doesn't appeal to them in some way. Yeah, exactly. How should someone look at that scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, you just hit a nail on a head for me because one of the things that I'm contemplating doing is starting some kind of online community group course. I, I'm still developing it very early stages for exactly those people. For those people who are employed or maybe are in between jobs, but have reached a point where they're saying, you know, I, I kind of would like to make a change, but it's not that I'm really unhappy or miserable, but I I'd like to think there's something more, but do I allow myself to even entertain that idea? And I've had a number of former clients of mine in that same age group who have said, you know, maybe I'll do more coaching with you. You know, I'm not quite ready yet. I've heard a lot of that. Like I, and I think when I hear that I'm not quite ready yet, I think there's a little fear underneath that because you've worked yourself to a certain point in your career, your life, you get comfortable with certain things. And the idea of kind of opening up something, you know, it could turn out you're opening things up and you're going to discover more and more things you really aren't that happy about or that you really would like to change. And then you're wondering, do I have the stamina, the energy, the bandwidth, the emotional bandwidth to really dig in and do this? And I'm thinking if I could put together a group of people like that who could both be in community with one another, not feel so alone with it and inspire and encourage one another and bring their wisdom to something like that. I think that would be really instrumental. So I think that there are ways to work with that. I think it's, first of all, you have to have some willingness to want to take a look in the mirror and say, you know, this is who I've been. Who do I want to be now? What would be different from where I am now? Is it about a job change or is it about having a, a discussion with my boss maybe about tweaking some of my responsibilities? I think sometimes when we think about making a change, we think about that it has to be something big or, oh, you, know, all, you know, all or nothing kind of thing. We either do it all or we don't do it at all. You got to go from A to Z rather than going from like A to B to C to D. And I think the, the people that I've been talking to on my podcast, for example, who have made some significant transitions, they didn't do it overnight. They did it very thoughtfully and planfully, and they gave themselves some time to kind of 
discover for themselves what was going to work for them. Essentially, the thing that I think is really key, I think is don't do it alone. And it doesn't have to be with a coach. But I do think that when you're thinking about at least taking a look and evaluating, where am I now? Where would I like to be? What would that look like? Maybe I don't know exactly what it would be, but I have some ideas about the qualities. What, it, what would it feel like? What would it taste like? What would it smell like? You know, just giving yourself a sense of what that experience might be and notice, you know, does it, do you feel like when you start to have those thoughts about what could possibly be next, you start to get excited or do you get scared or, you know, or do you start getting onto the internet and start looking things up? You know, what gets stirred within you? And sometimes fear and excitement can feel like the same thing anyway. Could you, yeah, describe sort of the feeling, how, how it, what it feels like, what it tastes like, the colors and the sensations inside of you now you've launched, I, I, you know, eight or nine episodes. I was on your, let's see, eight episodes. Um, so far. What does it feel like to be a relatively new uh, podcaster with eight episodes in the market? You know, it's a great question. I It feels like it was a long time coming. I almost feel I'm still learning a lot as I go along, mostly on the, the technical side of things. But there is another part of me that feels like I've been doing this for a long time already, that my sort of natural curiosity and enthusiasm for talking to people about what they do, what their journeys have been, and and how happy or not happy they've been along the way and how happy they are now. It's amazing how natural it has felt. And I'm I have to say I've surprised myself with the way I've jumped into it. Not, I mean it took me a long time to plan it out and figure out what I needed to do to get it launched, but once I launched, it didn't, I don't feel like I've only been doing this two months. And in fact, it's interesting. I do do a little pre-interview chat with my guests, um, mostly because I want to make sure that whatever we talk about is something that matters to them, because I feel like I want to shine a light on them. I figure whatever my presence is on the podcast, that will show up as me being me and people will get that. But I, I really feel like I have a responsibility and a desire to really shine a light on the people I interview and to share their fascinating, intriguing, exciting stories with the world. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and I'm your host for this podcast called Faye's World. Today on the show, please join me and Tammy guler Loeb, who is a career and executive coach. Tammy is part of Phase World's alt podcasters community created for podcasters who are rethinking and reinventing the way we make our podcasts. Tammy just launched her podcast called Work From The Inside Out. What are your thoughts on your thoughts on exchanging the interviews, you know, like, do you think it helps podcasters to kind of get to know each other, have to interview each other and such? Like, how do you deal with that? Um, there is, there is something maybe a little incestuous about podcasters interviewing one another, except that from my perspective, given what my podcast is about, it's actually very appropriate because most of the people and most people in general have had more than one career. And so I'm trying to learn about how people make these transitions, you know, and I think that people who podcast enjoy what they're doing. Why would they do it otherwise? Right. I mean, that would be my thought. So it's felt fine to me, but I also want to make sure that I'm telling, you know, stories of other people who wouldn't be your typical outgoing podcasting person, let's say, but it's inspiring too. It's inspired. I just, I love being around people who are creative or trying to create something, trying to send a message. They're not just getting up and doing the same thing day after day. So like what is measurable or tangible results often being talked about in the market today is so opposite of what we as creators experience, whether I've been doing it for four years, I've been doing it for two months, doesn't matter. How do you measure a success like that? I mean, to me, that is just incredible. If I were to score that, that is like a mega check plus and beyond 
of a guest on your show getting to know a new client. Who knows a client for, I don't care, one month or it could be 10 years. Yeah. I mean, I love the question about success because I do think that a lot of the conversations I'm having with people, with my clients, with my podcast guests is all about oftentimes, here's what I thought success was supposed to look like. And so I was raised to believe that success looked like this. You know, you go to school, you develop a profession, you meet somebody, you get married, you have 2.3 children, you, you know, you, 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 you follow this path. And I'm, I'm sort of painting a very conventional picture, but, you know, whatever that image of success was for you. And, and then you follow that path and you realize, actually, that I don't really like this. <laughs> I need to do something else to feel successful. So I think that our definition of success, we really have to take stop and take a take stock of what what's going to really be rewarding for us. Isn't that what being successful is about is what's the reward? Now for some people they think being successful is making a lot of money. I've been talking to a lot of people lately who are saying, "Yeah, I want to make money. I have to make money, but that is definitely not what's going to leave me feeling successful." I think we really have to be far more mindful of what what success means to us and to really, we owe it to ourselves to go after whatever that is for us, or at least to try to discover what that is, I think. So how did you, what was the path, like your origin story to find your success? And I know it was, and for me, continues to be a very iterative, iterative process and my success, what it looked like in 2017 compared to 18 compared to this year, already different. We're talking about a three-year, two-year span right now. Like, So is it possible for you to kind of bring us back to, as you mentioned, maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when you started your coaching practice? Who were the first you know, few clients, even if you don't have to mention them by name, but how did you even identify that's who they are? Or like, this is the service you're going to offer to them. I love it. Um, I was already in the middle of my coaching program and I was at a family party and one of um, my husband's cousin's wives, I was starting to tell her about my coaching program and what I was interested in, in terms of a coaching practice. And she just said, I really need you. She became my first paying coaching client. Uh, I decided from day one, I wanted it to be a referral-based business. I didn't want to spend a lot of money or time like advertising. And we're, we're talking 20 years ago, you know, things were very different then in terms of how you got your message out and how you engage people. And I still think word of mouth is the most powerful of anything. But back then it was even, you know, there were many more options now than there were then, I think. And so that's what I kept doing from from day one onward. And it's been an almost entirely referral-based business because of that. Um, I try to remember like 20, 20 years ago, were you talking about around 2000 or a little before, a little after that? Yeah, right around that. Um, I think I started my, my coaching program and certification in 1998 or 99. Um, I had a young child already, so I had other, and I had, I was working, so I was fitting everything in, but, um, you know, at that time, I just knew that I wanted to do something that I could feel some ownership of, um, and really put my mark on it, but also to help people, just to help people have a better quality of life. Um, I always wanted to help people, so, so most of my career really did include that, but I did reach a point where I was doing a lot of work that really didn't, I didn't feel like I was helping anybody. So that's when I started to look and I found out about coaching and then literally hit the ground running in no time. I mean, I heard about it, spoke to one coach, looked into a few programs, signed up for the Coaches Training Institute and literally got on a plane every month for those next four months and flew to different locations to get the classes in because I couldn't wait to do it. I think I borrowed money from my parents. And then I did the certification program. And I got to say, like, first of all, congrats. 18 years, 19, nearly 19 years later, you've been doing this. And uh, if I understand correctly, you never went back to a full-time job. 
No, I think for a few years, what I did was I, I had a part-time job, sort of a little bit of a financial anchor. I mean, I, I was married and had a full-time salary that my husband brought in, although there was a short period of time where he was out of work for a little while. And we did rely on my part-time job, which fortunately gave me benefits at the time. But I did hold down a, while I was in the middle of my coaching training and certification, I was working part-time as an administ- a program administrator at Tufts University. And that was a really interesting job. So I actually liked that. Um, I got to work with students there and I got to run, help run a program. It was great. Um, but then within a few years of, of that and getting my certification, I was really ready to go out on my own. And that's when I went on my own. So I had finished my certification, I think. And then at that juncture, I think I had enough clients and you know, probably had enough of a conversation with my husband to say, I'd really like to do this full time now. And um, one thing that's been really helpful, though, I will say, and I think this is, I've been very fortunate. Over the years that I've been out on my own, I've always had some kind of project or contract with an organization where they would hire me for an entire year to do something for them. And it might only be maybe 20 hours a month at most, not a lot of time. Some maybe it would take up 10 or 20% of my revenue. But I always had some kind of steady consulting work or something that's always been in place. And for about 12 years, I worked with public schools facilitating school improvement teams and helping them with school improvement planning. And the same time that that dried up, I got this wonderful contract with the United Way to do some work with with organizations that work with low-income populations, teaching them coaching skills, to use coaching skills with these low-income populations. So really trying to build more empowerment into working with folks who are struggling rather than just helping them teaching them to help themselves. I've been really, really fortunate in that way to always have that kind of steadiness because all my other work, it kind of ebbs and flows and comes and goes. You have to be tolerant of that kind of ebb and flow to work this way. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and I'm your host for this podcast called Faze World. Today on the show, please join me and Tammy Gulerlob, who is a career and executive coach. Tammy is part of Faze World's alt podcasters community, created for podcasters who are rethinking and reinventing the way we make our podcasts. Tammy just launched her podcast called Work From The Inside Out. I mean, that's, that's such great advice because, as you know, a lot of people before they can transition from full-time to freelance, they have to burn the midnight oil or whatever and have to start to gain the freelance clients while they still have full-time jobs. And, you know, do you find that, you know, 10, 15, 20% of the revenue that you gather from these um, jobs working part-time for these organizations all of the above, you know, financial, financial, spiritual, emotional satisfaction, like all of the above. I mean, financially, you know, when you talk about schools or the United Way nonprofit, it, you know, we're talking very modest rates of pay, but it's steady money that's coming in. It's solid, you know, and I would say, though, that greater benefit is, is the fact that I, I can see the impact of what I'm doing. I've developed great relationships with people. And as a result of that work, it's led to other projects and other things because people know who I am now and they know what I'm capable of. So I've been invited to uh, facilitate board retreats or um, teach coaching classes in other places, um, both for-profit and nonprofit. So it's all these relationships that get developed over time. And when you work with people, it's like, it's like having the benefit of having sort of sort of co-workers in some ways, even though I'm not really an employee. I get the benefit of the relationships, but I don't have to get immersed in any of the organizational politics, which I love. I love. Me too. And I'm so glad you brought up the marketing aspect of things because 
it, it frustrates me somehow when I talk to freelancers or creators who say, I want to do the work, but I really hate marketing or I already did this piece of marketing, whether it's social media or me speaking at an event, and there's no new client turnout from that crowd, and it was a waste of my time. Like, But at the same time, I'm also quite understanding of that because it is hard when we have to work and market ourselves and worry about collection, invoicing, collection. And this, you know, like, as you said, Tammy, I heard that you sometimes will travel, drive an hour to go somewhere. Sometimes that's nights and weekends. How do you parse that out? How do you interpret that or your message for perhaps, you know, the next generation of freelancers and coaches? Like, how do you balance and parse these things out? What's worth it and what's not? You mean, uh, well, I think it's trial and error. There are times where, uh, and I actually just had a conversation with somebody about this earlier today, about, you know, there are times where I'll get invited to speak somewhere, but they don't have any money to pay me. And then I have to decide whether it doesn't matter. I I do believe in karma. I believe that what comes around goes around, that if you put good things out there in the world somewhere, it will come back. It just may not come back from the same place. I have to say that over time, I've gotten a little bit more restricted about some of that because there have been times where I put myself out there to do something. And, you know, it's not even whether it pays off or not. It's just the feeling. I I get the feeling that when you offer something pro bono, you want it to feel valued in some way. And I will, I have started saying no to some things and it's not about the money per se, but it is the spirit around it. So it's not always tangible, but I also am aware that I bring 20 years of experience in this now to the table. Um, I can't be running around driving for an hour each way So I just try to just say, is this something I want to put myself into? And, and, you know, do I have the time? Do I have the bandwidth to do it? Will I have the impact I hope to have? And I, you know, I go into it. Once I decide yes, I stop worrying about all the what ifs. Yeah, exactly. It's not worth it. So at this moment in time, like what are your hopes and dreams and wishes and things whether it's self-improvement or something that you want to do for your clients that that you've oriented yourself towards for 2019? Well, you know, it's funny. This year is the first year I think I've really kind of envisioned or had a vision. I usually just keep going and I don't think about things in years. But this year I have two things. One is this is my year of saying no. <laughs> yeah. And when I say no, it means I'm saying yes to something else. So for example, some certain types of requests for either something that's pro bono or something that I feel is is going to zap my energy rather than fuel me. So I'm paying attention to that. I'm also trying to make some adjustments in my business and to do activities that will reach more people. I feel like I have a lot of things to share, a lot of good messages to send out there, and I want to reach more people. And I can't do that if I'm always doing one-on-one coaching. So I'm changing my, uh, I wouldn't say I'm completely changing my business model, but I'm shifting it in in a way where I'm trying to reach more people in, in shorter periods of time. So I'm working on some things around that. This sort of group of maybe middle-aged or a little later, you know, professionals who are sort of ready for something new, but they're not really sure what or whether they want to make the jump. But I think there's, there's some space in there to really maybe create some community around that. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. And the podcast is such a great step forward. Um, Imagine anybody in the world right now can tune in and listen to who cares one episode, all eight episodes, anywhere in the world in your sleep while you're sleeping Mm -hmm. and while your message being, you know, spread out. It just, it's an incredible feeling. And I think sometimes we, underappreciate and undervalue the power of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, for some reason, had this idea in my head. It was completely made up. Um, I thought, well, you know, if I get, you know, 25 to 30, you know, distinct downloads per episode, you know, out of the gate, early, early episodes, that'll be pretty good. Well, I've had over a hundred downloads, well over a hundred downloads of every episode so far. 
I feel like I'm excited about what I have to share with people. So again, there's no ego in it. It's just, I just want to share this with everybody. I think it's wonderful. I, that's a, you, you touch upon the fact that some people create something and then they're so hesitant to share with the world. And I know why it's hard and why it can be hard. And I remember the early days of me trying to say, hi, like whispering, I have a podcast. This <laughs> might be okay. Like you might like it. It's someone that we all know. And I remember some of the side eyes I got, like <laughs> that she, she's not a speaker. English is not even her first language. And <laughs> that has been long forgotten, but there was definitely some tension of people, think, people thinking like, is she kidding? Like, <laughs> you know, what is going on? Really? Um, Wow. Yeah, not for, but the thing is, those side eyes came from very few people, and yet yeah. that's what set me back emotionally a little uh, bit. But we have uh. to look at look to the hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are you know really cheering us on and really believe in what we're doing. Yeah, well, that's another interesting point. Yeah, I've been talking to people about this lately. That you know. I feel like with this podcast, I'm putting myself out there in ways I never have before. And it's been interesting to see who's really excited about it. And I'm getting great feedback and who has said almost nothing to me about it. And it's sort of surprising. And I, I'm thinking either they don't realize how much work this has been or what a labor of love this has been for me, or they're uncomfortable with it in some way because some of them have said nothing to me. And I, I was a little hurt at first about that. And now I've just realized it's not about me. It's about them. And so, uh, you know, whatever, if they, if they're not interested, they're not listening or they don't want to acknowledge it to me. I, I, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, yeah. Awakening call to, to say that, you know, because it's so open now, anybody could open up a YouTube account, could create a podcast and upload it somewhere. And, because it's so accessible. And there's no excuse to say that Ellen or Oprah didn't choose me. So now you can do it too. And when you do it, and, and other people chose not to, it really creates that tension that almost like separates you into two completely different cohorts. Like you can't even be friends anymore. And it was like really interesting phenomenon going on. It is. It's been very interesting. And I've decided to see it that way at this point, rather than like getting myself all mixed up you know, emotionally into it. it. And it's not that I'm not emotional. It just, you know, I know that I love what I'm doing. It, that's really all I need to know. Yeah, you know? exactly. And I know there's value. Going in Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode. And I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Phase Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Phase Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you.